There's nothing I love more than authenticity, which is why I'm so excited about Salsa de la Vida hot sauce, which has been on kitchen tables in Mexico since 1956. It will be available here in the U.S. for purchase later this year. In addition to livening up your food, it's Mexican-owned, it's woman-owned, and it's one of the only hot sauce brands to have 100% Mexican source pepper mix. Salsa de la Vida hot sauce will be available here in the United States to purchase on shelves later this year. Hey there, I'm Leslie Levine Harvell. Welcome to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. I believe the best way to explore a topic in depth is to view it through multiple lenses. Join us as we explore race, culture, and societal issues through the lens of industry experts, writers, cultural critics, and HBCU students. Over 150 years ago, Blankety Blank Spirits was born on the outskirts of one of the nation's premier thoroughbred horse farms. Today, we invite you to join us in our reconstructed 1820s ice house for an exclusive opportunity. Unlike any other distillery, tasting, or bar venue, this hour-long program is limited to a small audience to guarantee a secluded and relaxed experience. Let our storytellers walk you through the history of whiskey and bourbon from the time of revolution through prohibition, while sipping on many cocktails. Okay, so we're beginning a new topic series today called Colonialism, but make it sexy. Over the course of the next four Mondays, we're going to explore the romanticism of colonialism in popular culture. You know what I'm talking about. Vietnamese restaurants designed to look like a French colonized Hanoi, Melania Trump's pith helmet and Taylor Swift's Wildest Dreams videos and things that are specifically designed to invoke the image of British colonialism in Africa. And of course, your good old meat cutes with plantations, like the one we started this episode with, which is an actual tour description currently being offered on a plantation in Nashville. I'm not a marketing expert, but there is something about the aesthetic of colonial periods that continues to make its way into various aspects of our culture and that appeals to a particular demographic. So before we talk about the what, you know how we do here on Impolite Conversation, I want to delve into the why. Today, we're going to explore the psychology of historical nostalgia and who better to do this with than Caitlin Folks. I'm so excited to chat with Caitlin, who is joining us from across the pond and is a psychologist that specializes in nostalgia. She conducted one of the first pieces of empirical research on historical nostalgia and developed the first index to measure personality traits associated with historical nostalgia. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks for joining us. Hiya, thanks for having me. (laughs) Glad to be here. (laughs) Caitlin, I cannot tell you how excited I am to have this conversation. It is so fascinating to me. But before we get into our chat, because you have so much knowledge and I just want to make sure I am establishing a baseline for myself and for my listeners, (laughs) I want to establish a few definitions. So personal nostalgia and historical nostalgia are two different emotions, right? I want to make sure I'm using the proper term too. Nostalgia is an emotion, correct? Yeah. So nostalgia is the overall emotion. And then you've got personal nostalgia and historical nostalgia, which are like the two branches of nostalgia. So personal nostalgia would be longing to go back to do something that I personally did. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And an example of that would be maybe I smell something that reminds me of my grandfather's cooking and I begin to reminisce about my summers in Jamaica with my cousins. Yeah, typically it's from your childhood or early adolescence. It's visiting a time within your own life, things that remind you of things that have happened to you directly in your life. Okay, perfect. And generally speaking, is personal nostalgia a positive emotion and are there health benefits to it? Yeah, so numerous research has been done on personal nostalgia and it's said to serve a range of beneficial functions such as sociality functions, helping you feel connected to others, help you feel connected to those that are long gone, like you just mentioned your grandfather, a loss of perhaps your younger self and the things you used to enjoy. It helps you feel connected to those early days and asserts a kind of continuity over your time period of your life. Yeah. Okay, got it. All right. So I gave smell as a trigger for personal nostalgia, but what sorts of things in general might trigger someone's personal nostalgia? Okay, so there's a range of things. As you say, all of the sensory functions, so smell, uh, taste, 
you often find it with taste if there's okay as you say with your grandfather's cooking like something that you've made for food for example or a song is so powerful and I especially find this with myself too like music is the one <laughs> so whenever I hear a song and it can take you right back to that place yeah I'd say that music is one of the more popular ones but anything like a film or visiting a place there's lots of different things that can trigger personal nostalgia for a person. It's not one rule fits all. Can you distinguish personal nostalgia from historical nostalgia? Fundamentally, what makes them different? Personal nostalgia, as we've said, is a wistful affection for the past. It's defined as for your own past, that is. So revisiting a time in your life that you've directly experienced. Historical nostalgia branches off from that because it's a wistful affection for the past, but it's for a life that you've never actually encountered. So it's mm. almost like a form of mental time travel. You never lived in that time. You're longing for an era or decade, which you've never been in. You've only experienced that through the eyes of other people or through a film or through a story retelling or through a book or through music, perhaps. It's something that you've taken from culture or family and you've taken on that representation and you have a real strong desire to visit that time because you think it's superior to the present day. All right. That's interesting. And I'm curious. I know that one of the goals of your study was to understand the psychological profile of someone who would be more prone to experiencing historical nostalgia. What personality traits did you measure on the index that you developed? So we had an index, the historical nostalgia scale. There was one that hadn't been done before. So we had basically created this scale to measure things like, uh, so you had to agree with statements, for example, where it said, I often feel like I was born in the wrong generation. I listen to my parents' music. I have a great fondness for movies in my grandparents' generation, things like that. And that would assess how prone you are to, as I say, prone you are to historical nostalgia versus personal nostalgia. There's a few scales that measure personal nostalgia. So we used that scale and we measured it against typical personality scales in psychology. So we have this thing in psychology called the big five, which is if there's any kind of personality research, we kind of throw the big five at it and see what comes out. And that big five is introverts and extroversion. So how extroverted you are, do you go out a lot, are you sociable or you're more a close person, you like your alone time. There's neuroticism. So that's like, are you over emotional? Are you wobbly? Are you anxious? how much you feel things as a person. You've got openness, so how open you are to experiences, conscientiousness, and agreeableness is the last one. So how agreeable you are with other people, other people's views, societal views. And yeah, so we kind of threw all those five in our personality study. I think this is so fascinating. So you mentioned, for example, liking music from a different time period. What were some of the other questions that you asked? So what we did is we actually subjected them to six or seven personality scales. So in that initial scale, the one that I devised on the historical nostalgia scale, it was things like movies, it was things like music, how often you feel like you want to return to a time in the past. It's whether you still wear the clothes from a different time, which is quite relevant with the revival fashion and stuff nowadays. That was quite a popular one with a lot of people. You find yourself wearing like, like, I feel like a big 70s kind of revival coming back at the moment, especially in the UK. So that related to a lot of people. It was also things like I would prefer to watch a classic film over a modern blockbuster. Things like that. Mm. And as it relates to the various indices, what were your findings? Where did subjects fall in terms of whether or not they were more likely to experience historical nostalgia? So we found that if we start off with just the big five, so personality-wise, it said that we actually found that historical nostalgia tends to be more prevalent in those that are high on neuroticism, who had high neuroticism scores, so very emotional people. Also with openness, we found that people that were open were more likely to have nostalgic tendencies towards the time that they weren't living in. We also found, funnily enough, that with the big five, that agreeableness had a negative scoring with one of our historical nostalgia measures. So other than the index that I had used, we also used part of another scale, which has previously been used for historical nostalgia, called the Holbrook measure. 
And that talk less about the commodities in life, such as clothes and fashion and films and music. And it talked more about attitudes towards the past and things like, well, it touched on antiques, but it talked more about attitudes towards the past, like cynicism and stuff. And we actually found that those that were higher in historical nostalgia scored, they were less agreeable with that measure. So that's quite an interesting finding. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Which would make sense. All of this is just so fascinating to me. There is an entire industry that is built on essentially pre-Civil War in the United States, like the culture of the South while there were enslaved people here. That whole aesthetic of a Southern woman, how she should behave and what she looks like and what a Southern gentleman is and, you know, mythology around that. And obviously none of these people who long for that time or celebrate that time, they've never lived in it. So I think this is so interesting. And this is obviously an audio podcast, so folks can't see you, but you're white. And thanks for sharing that awesome picture. Your great grandmother was fully black Jamaican and your great grandmother was half white British and half black Jamaican, which means by definition that your grandmother who was white passing was black, too. So irrespective of how you present phenotypically, you're part of the African diaspora. Your ancestors, at least part of them, as well as mine, were enslaved and forced to toil on a sugar plantation in Jamaica. When I look at a bottle of rum or like a brand where you see that old timey imagery of a plantation, I don't experience it the way the brand is intending, which is clearly trying to speak to some sort of some aspect of someone's psyche where the image of a plantation would evoke a positive emotion. And so I'm curious about this. Obviously, you're not a marketer, but I think like some examples are many Vietnamese restaurants that are designed to look like when they were colonized by the French and and what that looks like. And so there's a certain feeling that a person who is from Southeast Asia would feel when they go inside there and they see something that is essentially designed to reflect a time that they wouldn't even be able to eat there. Or like I brought up Melania Trump's hat. So I don't know if you, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you probably don't know about this. No, but I, I don't know that. Trump, but enlighten me. I'd love to know. <laughs> yeah. So Melania Trump went to some African country and she was wearing a hat. It's actually not just a hat. It's called a pith helmet. The hat is basically what British colonizers wore. It was like a hat that represents that time period. Even like Taylor Swift, right? Like she had this video called Wildest Dreams. And do you know what video I'm talking about? Yeah, I have watched it. Yeah. (laughs) So that entire aesthetic is taken from the movie Out of Africa, which is romanticizing. It's viewing Africa through the eyes of a colonizer. I know you're not a marketer. But what do you think the psychology is of that, of using those types of images in popular culture? Like, why would that be popular? Basically, when historical nostalgia, like the roots of it in literature or psychology or anything, is from advertising literature. It's a term almost that's coined in advertising literature, so in the marketing world. It's known as quite a really powerful tool in order to sell things to people. And... They know that because it's appealing to the consumer psyche. It's appealing to the consumer psyche because if you present something to someone that perhaps there's been lots of films made about or music videos, as you say, it's like a really romanticized view. You're appealing to that consumer psyche that's, oh, the good old days. Okay, so they view the past. They're thinking anyway that the consumer, not all consumers evidently, But they're thinking that perhaps their target consumer or their target population is looking at that product and they're thinking it's like kind of evoking like a warm feeling in them, which is like, oh, I know this. I'm familiar with this. Those good old days. You know, I've heard stories about this. I learned about this in school. It's kind of providing a sense of security. You know, when you look back at the old days, especially I know the way that I was brought up in England at school and things like that. You look back to the 50s and 60s, for example. And when you have the 50s housewife there baking the cake, like Soap and Glory is a brand in the UK. 
And uh, it's all 50s housewife and Amityville this and Stepford Wives that. It's about being the perfect woman and being subservient, all of that kind of stuff. And what it does is it actually provides a safe ideal. Okay, and perhaps that's slightly different when you're taking something like, like out of Africa, for example, like Wildest Dreams, Taylor's video, because actually what it's doing is for some, yes, it will provide that safe ideal. But for others, it's like that exotic ideal that we've been shown. Like it's that whitewashed version. Taylor Swift's video actually reminded very much of that old like 50s, 60s Elizabeth Taylor out on the set, just with all of the animals and the exoticness and the wide desert soundscapes, things like that. And it's funny because, as I say, especially from my point of view, the way that Africa has been presented to me throughout my life. And as I say, the way that the media and TV and the entertainment industry is whitewashed or anyway, the things that are the most popularized are whitewashed and you pick the desirable bits out that you want and it actually removes the negative trace. And I think that that is what historical nostalgia is all about. That's why it's such a powerful tool for marketers to use historical nostalgia because it can represent like, oh, this golden age, this fantasy land. Like I've heard so much about how great this was and I want to return there. I want to transport there from my daily mundane boring life to this place that's seemingly so glossy and everything's great and everything's ideal and romanticized. It's got that golden tinged aesthetic. And we all know that's not true and that's not the way things really were. We know that's not an accurate depiction of the time. But that's, as I say, that's the problem is that it's a filtered version in our minds of what actually happened. And we filter it because if I think about the white consumer, I think it's because it's convenient for them to filter out those negative aspects, you know. Okay, I wouldn't say for the majority of people that it's an ignorance per se, but it's more like what they've been brought up on, what they know, and it's convenient for them to leave out those negative traces. It's convenient because they have a privilege at the end of the day, and that is the problem. That's where the inequality lies. And it would be really interesting to see how historical nostalgia did appeal to people of color like the black consumer i would say even like the black consumer i would say the indian consumer thinking about the british raj the southeast asian consumer when you think about french imperialism there any colonized group i don't know what the laws were in the uk in the 1950s in the united states in the 1950s black people were not fully citizens they didn't get the right to vote until later than that. The imagery was very similar here in terms of advertising like soap and household products. Like this is how women looked and this is how they had the martini and the slippers for their husband and and things like that. Black people were experiencing the United States very differently. Imagery from the 1950s is not necessarily like a safe place in the United States for black people. More impolite conversation in just a moment. The new HBO documentary Yusuf Hawkins Storm Over Brooklyn tells the story of Yusuf Hawkins, a black teenager who was murdered in 1989 by a group of young white men in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. His death and the official response to it sparked outrage in New York. The film, directed by Muta Ali Muhammad, explores the 30-year legacy of Yusuf's murder and his family and friends reflect on the tragedy and the subsequent fight for justice that inspired and divided New York City. Stream it now on HBO Max. Visit hbomax.com to sign up for your seven-day free trial. I'm curious, in the same way that, let's say, a smell or music can trigger personal nostalgia, what would trigger historical nostalgia? I think it would probably be very similar to personal nostalgia, which it would be a range of things. People talk about a certain film or a certain music video or perhaps what we call something intergenerational nostalgia, which is like when it's passed down from your family or a caregiver or like your parents. It's those stories that are passed down about how great it was. I remember, for example, my grandparents always talking to me about the 50s when I was younger and they always said, oh, we've seen the best of it, is what they always used to say to me when I was a little girl. And I think that 
there's always something, that first foundational thing that stays in your brain, that sticks with you. All it takes sometimes is one film or one book or learning about like a literary great in school or learning about a great artist. For example, we actually found in our study that people more prone to historical nostalgia had a higher appreciation of beauty and excellence, which is like a greater appreciation for like the big names, you know, like Picasso or Herman Hesse or Oscar Wilde. And if they develop like a fanatic obsession with that, then everything else fits in and they're like, oh yeah, I'd love to live in that time. There's a movie called Midnight in Paris that's actually, I think it was on Netflix not too long ago. It's the only film blockbuster ever to to talk about historical nostalgia or anything like that. And it's got Owen Wilson in it. And he is obsessed with Paris, so the Parisian golden age. And he's obsessed with all of these writers and classic artists. And that obsession and that infatuation basically paves his way for his dissatisfaction with the present. So it's not even necessarily that that time period or everything about it is something that he has always loved or dreamed of being in. But it's like those key figures are what is drawing him to that time. And the way they talk about that time or the way they romanticize that time, you know, he buys into the idea you're buying into that fictitious kind of interpretation. There's a movie called Indochine. And it is what has inspired like a lot of basically Indochic, that Indochic aesthetic. Like they're seeing that part of the world through the lens of a white person. Generally speaking, what did people think about when they experienced historical nostalgia? Most people referred to the way one or others used to be. So there's lots of references to society. A lot of people spoke about the war and hardships of war and like they didn't have a romanticized view at all. And then other people talked about, especially um, the Victorian era, talking about like the upheld morality and how people were kind of kind of a bit like your Southern hospitality in the US, mm-hmm. kind of those upheld more rigid values. But people, you know, wore their Sunday best every day. It was a real attitudinal thing. And I think that that related, funnily enough, quite well with the present in the fact that those people that are dissatisfied with the present, whether that's the tech technological intrusion, indirect means of communication, that kind of loss of community between one another. Those were the type of things that were really valued by these people. Those were the kind of things that people mentioned. We also found that in these nostalgic episodes, it increased perceptions of societal continuity. It made people feel closer to other people. It incited more optimism. It incited more inspiration for people, which are both future orientated emotions. It gives you like a boost to creativity, perhaps, in some cases. Other people mentioned a higher activated negative effect in some cases, some positive. There was a real mix between those. It was a real 50-50. There was actually one study that suggests that there are two types of historical nostalgic people. There's one that is what we call existential historical nostalgic people. So those are typically elderly people who have lost their role in society, perhaps they've experienced lots of bereavements and things like that. And they connect to historical nostalgia because it reminds them of objects that might have still been used in their lifetime by their parents or grandparents, whatever. They they still see the fragments and it reminds them of their younger self. So a bit linked to personal nostalgia. It's like the quest for personal authenticity. And then the other type of nostalgia is the aesthetics which are predominantly young people or young adults. And rather than a loss of roles, it talks more about role intrusion. So people that have got lots of daily stressors, lots of anxiety in life, feel like they've got too many things bubbling all over them at once. That's interesting. Before I get into my last question, I wanted to know, was there anything that I didn't cover or I didn't ask that you think would also be relevant to share? I think that one of the interesting parts of historical nostalgia is what is being considered historical nostalgic as a collective response. So when the term historical nostalgia was first brought about, it was brought into terminology by Barbara Stern in 1992, who talks about historical nostalgia as something called the fin de siècle effect, which means the end of century effect, 
which means that when people are going through like a whole era, a whole century, you know, when they're coming towards the end of that, that's when they are like, oh, we've got cultural anxiety about what's coming next. The future's unpredictable. So let's look to things we know have definitely happened. We know that definitely safe, you know, our ancestors and their ancestors before them have lived through it. They've been there. We've got the documents to prove it. Let's look back. Rather than anticipating that uncertainty of what's about to come, let's look back. They talk about how historical nostalgia, well, communal nostalgia, is ripe in like epochal changes, so like wars and invasions, environmental catastrophes, times of chaos. And so for the research to take place earlier this year, you know, 2020, what a year. And especially for a place like the US as well, with your elections and Trump going on. And there's lots of factors right now that make this a very predominant time period. Right. Because there's also this make America great again. Yes. Right. Almost yes. like this. Right. That actual phrase is, to me, I think, rooted in historical nostalgia, just trying to tap into that. You're so right. There's things like in the UK, like Brexit. A lot of people have got that view in the UK of Brexit that's like, by voting for Brexit, you're kind of returning to the rural Britannia, you know, let's make, as you say, let's make kind of England great again. And it's... And what does that actually mean, depending on who you are? Right. right? It, depending on who you are, it's like, what is it that you're trying to say you want to go back to? It, it's funny because it, it talks about... Fred Davis talks about communal nostalgia actually being really ripe in the 70s, so like the 70s identity crisis in the US because of all the turmoil that happened in the 60s with the Kennedy assassinations and the civil rights movement, all of that kind of stuff. It said that the 70s nostalgic reaction was actually, as I say, like it was a reaction to all those turmoil of the 60s. You know, they were looking back thinking, you know, where's a place that's safe? And the one thing I will touch upon is... There are a very select subgroup of people who will use historical nostalgia to maintain social ills. And I feel like perhaps this is the exact population of people that you're talking about when it comes to that extreme side of nostalgia. So plantation weddings, perhaps people may be associated with the bells. Bells? Yeah, like Southern Bells. Bell, Birmingham yeah, Bells like, and things like that. Yeah, I feel like and I, I'm not speaking for the majority of that population at all, but for sure... By my estimation, there will be some individuals there who will use this nostalgia to maintain social ills. So I think that for the most people, for the majority, it's not about maintaining the social ills. It's not about those particular controversial views. It's more that they're picking certain things they like out of a time period. And all of a sudden, they're like assimilating that to everything else in that time, ignoring the negative bits out of convenience rather than ignorance. As I said before, like it's a convenient thing for them because they either have privilege or it doesn't affect them directly. Right. A lot of what they're romanticizing, it's being made possible by the subjugation of people of color, whether whether these people are Asian, whether they're African, whether they were enslaved Africans and they're brought to the Americas. Like a lot of these things that are being romanticized are being built on the backs of people who are being colonize. And let's not forget the indigenous people when they do also colonize. And I think there's something interesting that you said about cultural anxiety, because right now, Black Lives Matter in the United States, I don't know if you've heard of that, but Black Lives Matter is essentially an raised awareness and consciousness and demands on the state to call attention to in all the ways that Black lives have not mattered, whether that's through police brutality access to capital for potential Black business owners, whether that's the maternal death rate for Black mothers in childbirth. There are daily demonstrations and protests, and we're going through our own modern present day civil rights era here in the United States. So it's interesting when you brought up when people are feeling cultural anxiety, they retreat to historical nostalgia. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point that I hadn't thought about. But yeah, you're right with the whole Black Lives Matter. And as you say, for a lot of people, you know, it's a time where they are really standing up for their rights. They're calling attention, you know, it's about time that they're calling attention to all of these issues and all of these problems. However, for some people, that scares them. It's a really uncomfortable truth, but it really shakes up their way of life, their way of living. There's a lot of people that are looking to be held accountable, that are thinking maybe they just don't like change. Maybe they're old, slightly older people who are thinking things have been fine because it's not convenient to them. I was curious also, 
I didn't have a name for it. But when you said, I think you called it intergenerational nostalgia. So black people look at Gone with the Wind very differently than white people would. I read this entire article about how this book is passed on from mother to daughter as a sort of symbol of persevering in hard times as this, you know, this woman. And Black people see Gone with the Wind very, very differently. I I almost feel like there has to be a lot of overlap between historical nostalgia and intergenerational nostalgia and also things that have social ills to them. I'm sure that there are people who long for a time that they didn't have to compete with Black people for jobs. You know what I mean? Some of the good old days is built on that, right? It's very interesting what you said. Like in England, when people look back and they look at that, as you say, like when people didn't have to compete with black people for jobs and things like that, England, and especially rural England where I live, has always been so predominantly white people. It still is now. There's still a very small percentage of other, well, of ethnic minorities. It would be also very interesting to see geographically the attitudes because, as you say, if you look at Brexit and you look at the divide between people that voted for Brexit and people that voted against Brexit, and some people list immigration as that kind of problem, that's the reason they voted for Brexit. Um, That geographical divide, you know, you're seeing people in London, you're seeing all of that, and like the immigration to them is not an issue because it's very culturally diverse. The city is culturally diverse. You come all the way to Somerset, where I am, I can't really equate it to the South America, but it's the closest thing we have to that. So you're saying where you live is like the southern part of the United States? I live in Southwest England. Okay. Okay. And we're very, we're not densely populated with things like this coronavirus and stuff. We're like one of the least affected areas, you know, we're sparsely spread out. It's generally tends to be a wealthier place to live, like Cornwall, Devon, all of this down in the um, Southwest. And it's always been predominantly white. I remember even growing up at school and there was only like a few people of colour that I knew or even ethnic minorities. And even now, as I say, even now, it's still not, it would be interesting to test how much those people spoke about nostalgia, how much these people, because if these people aren't like as culturally diverse as people living in cities... Because I've lived in, as I say, Southampton and both. And the attitudes are tremendously different between both those populaces. It's, it's very interesting to see whether some people are a bit more forward thinking, a bit more open, a bit more far behind, a bit more inhibited, you know, stuck in their ways because they're that much more closed off and they don't want things to change because it's convenient for them. Right. So this has been such a rich conversation. Thank you so much. This is going to be a great foundation for us as we go into our subsequent episodes. Your research is so culturally significant. Yes, thank you so much for having me and letting me learn so much about American culture and the attitudes and views of it. There's so many things that have been brought to my attention that I've never like really had the chance to learn about. So it's really useful for me and helpful to my further research that I will do one day. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the work that you have done and are continuing to do. My last question is, and this is a fun one. As you know, this podcast is curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. It's your last night on earth. Where are you eating? Oh my goodness. That is so funny. When I whenever I ask people this question (laughs) and I'm like talking with experts, they're like stumped. My mom does make a very good roast dinner, I have to say. Okay, and what's on the table? What's on your plate? Yorkshire puddings. For sure. <laughs> you got ch- chicken, gravy, roast potatoes. See my face light up when I talk about food. Thank you for listening to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Icon Dinner and on the Iconoclast Dinner Experience Facebook page. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Hit us on socials or send us feedback at press at iconoclastdinner.com. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our podcast and we'd also love it if you rated and reviewed us. 